I tell you what, it's time that we act like we have authority and quit acting like we don't even count. We have to wait on, on a governmental system that is broke beyond belief to tell us what we can do and what we can't do. We come from the kingdom. Now, some of us come from the south side of the kingdom. We're a little gated gangsters. But I'm telling you what, we're going to get the job done before we get out of here. Every one of you have an anointing. But when two anointings get together, it creates an, another anointing that had never existed before. Just in this room, not counting on the other side of those cameras, but in this room, every one of you are anointed. We've come together in a corporate anointing, and it's created anointings that hell has never seen before. It's created an, an anointing in this thy day to bring the peace of heaven. To bring the peace of heaven into this earth. We begin to shout, Hosanna in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. And we begin to praise all of us together in a corporate setting. It's creating anointings that it fills the heavens with glory and that things begin to happen like at the Red Sea in Habakkuk when it says their glory filled the heavens and the tides rolled out in two directions and made a path to peace where there was no path to peace. You have to, you have to, to stay now in this and begin to say this Today, deliverance belongs to my peace. Why don't we just lift our hands right now and begin to call out and shout out the way they did then. And they said, begin to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. And then start saying, peace in heaven, peace in heaven. Come on, begin to do it in glory in the highest. Glory in the highest. We won't hold our peace. We're not going to hold it. We're going to begin to shout and begin to give Him praise. Come on. Glory to God in the highest. Knock, knock. Is the animation done yet? <laughs> so is it done? Do you have any idea how long animation takes to draw? Do you know how long one frame takes? Uh, I drew something on my lunch break in five minutes. I do this on my lunch break. Five minutes. It's not done. Uh, not done? What? How long do you think it's going to take? I don't know. A few months? A few months? That is so long from now. What are we going to tell the people? Howdy, y'all. I'm ready to record my first song. Have you talked to the band yet? I forgot to call them. <gasps> what? You know I can only play the guitar and the cowbell. Well, I know, I just... Should oh, we get boy. back order this now? It would be delivered before the first episode. Well, looks like a delay would be in order. A, a delay? delay? What? Well, for how long? How about the summer? That would be enough time for me. Well, that would be enough time for me to get a band together and record. And I have been wanting to change up my appearance a little for the show. 
Who does your film? <gasps> and that would be plenty of time for my order of 5,000 rubber ducks to come in. You think that'll be enough? The script doesn't call for 5,000 rubber ducks. Doubly just in case. So it's settled then. We'll delay the show till summer. Hi, everybody. Are we about ready to go? It's delayed till summer. Well, great. That'll be enough time for me to get my felt done. Does the chef even know we're making a show? <laughs> Never got to go into. See my family in months. <laughs> you know, a lot of people have been taught you can't have a test without a testimony. Mm -hmm. You can't have a testimony without a test. Right. You have to. You have to be tested, and God only puts on you what you can handle. And He, uh, you must be a strong person. You must be a strong person. <laughs> no, that would that would actually be really cruel. God yeah. does not put that stuff on you. If you can take a one column and write down, steal, kill, destroy anything bad you can think of, that is the devil, people. <laughs> right. And then if you can think, write down a column. Of everything that's the opposite of that. That's Love, <laughs> you know, joy, peace. That is that is God. Healing. In James 1, 14, and it says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I honestly think that the devil is shocked at what people do. Mm -hmm. Because if you're, if you're drawn away of your own lust... And enticed, and then the consequences come from that. Right. Then you know when people say, "Well, God's put God's put this suffering on me. God's testing me." No. Yeah. I mean that would be like you're you laid out in the street. Now don't go do this, <laughs> please don't. But um, it would be like somebody laying out in the street on a busy highway. And then wondering why they get hit by a car. Yeah. Well, you laid out in the street. Yeah. I mean, that, simple as that. it's just as simple as that. You, God didn't send a bus to hit you so that you could have a testimony. Right. All right. Well, you two ready for today's discussion? Yep. I sold 14 fishes. Top that. You... You did what? I sold 14 fishes, so I'm clearly the winner of this competition here. Huh? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? I got your text in the group chat that said this week we were going to sell fishes. Sell fishes? What is he... Oh, man. I apologize, Landon. I I meant to say this week we're talking about selfishness. It, it must have autocorrected. Are you serious? You mean I spent four hours on that boat for nothing?
somebody and say, you're looking good today. Yes, sir. Resurrection Day down south. Hallelujah. This is awesome. Well, he is risen just like he said. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. And this is the day that the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm glad today. Good to see you two up here, Krista. It's good to be here. Awesome. Well, how many is ready to celebrate? Yeah. Celebrate his name, the risen Christ. Woo! We're gonna make him visible today. Hallelujah!
the Lord.
come on, come on, stir it up, stir it up. Celebrating resurrection. 
and gives them the breath to speak. But let it be known that time is running out. It's like an hourglass and it's running out. And soon they will look upon him whom they pierced. And they will realize there is only one God. And it wasn't their idea and it wasn't their decision as to whom God is. For it is he who sitteth upon the circle of the earth and looks within time from eternity and breathes the breath of lives into all living. For his exhale of breath, the Yah, the Yah was breathed into covenant. Abraham, Sarah. For this life, Yeshua brought his breath to us. God in the flesh, only one. Jesus, Messiah. Let every breath and everything that has breath praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord on high whose name is magnified among the nations for a great ground swell of revival has begun in Iran. For in Iran they are fighting on two fronts. They are fighting Israel, but they are fighting Yah. And they are fighting the groundswell of Yeshua in their midst. For even now I am preaching in the heart of Iran. Even now, says the Lord, I am preaching in the heart of Iran. And top generals are turning toward Yeshua. Turning toward the God of Israel. Taking a trip around the world. Hearing the breath of Yah. A breath. The breath that a dragon cannot breathe. So I have sent my spirit among the china trees. And in the wind as it blows, those in Wisconsin are praying for them. And it's picking up in the wind of Yah. in the trees of China. North Korea, you do not hear the breath that blows through the willows and the boughs. 
while you plot your destruction, revival is swelling in your bowels. For missionaries long ago breathed the breath of Yah on your soil. And it has grown and grown and grown until now it's come to a boil. The boil in the sea. The boil in North Korea. is coming from me. <sighs> Play those air horns. For deep in the trees of the jungle and the banana trees here's my voice today. And nations in their wicked regimes are about to give sway to a breath coming through the trees like the garden in the cool of the day. For hear these words of prophecy, says the Lord, as I breathe them out today and say, Yah. Yeshua, 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 Come on! Yeshua, 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 Come on! Yeah. Yeah. Say his name, Yeshua, 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 Yeshua. Yeshua, 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 Yeshua in the trees, Yeshua on every breeze, Yeshua in the islands, Yeshua, 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 Yeshua. Yeshua, 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 Yeshua. lift our hands and our voices and give Yeshua praise for he is the one overcame death hell and the grave he is the one Yeshua mighty to save he is the one that hell could not defeat he is the one with the name Scars in his hands and feet. He's Yeshua, 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 Yeshua.
Yeshua, come on. Yeshua, 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 Jesus, Yeshua, Jesus, Yeshua, Jesus, Yeshua, Jesus. On that day, the sun grew dark. Longer than any time in history All Eclipse bows to his name All the Eclipse bows to his name He is Lord of all Mighty to be praised He has overcome Death, hell, and the grave. Yeshua. Yeshua. Come on. Yeshua. 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 What they had done when they threw him in the pit and then he was pulled out by slave masters it was symbolic of Jesus being buried in the ground and having to endure slave masters in hell but after three days and nights the praise of God brought him out the mighty Holy Ghost stormed in in hell looking for the beloved he found him there oh he found him there Turn him loose, let him go. He never committed a sin that's theirs, in case you wanted to know. Turn him loose, and hell released all holds because he had never committed a sin. And he was demanded by the Holy Ghost. And light stormed into the pits of the damned. And raised again the great I Am. He came out with great power. He came out. power dragging death by the juggler vein he defeated death hell and the grave on that day and now he wears his special coat of many colors again for every tribe and tongue of every man Red, white, yellow, brown, any other color that happens to hit town. He is the king, the savior. He's Lord. And a special place and a special stripe for everything. 
of mankind. He's forgiven. He's made a way for you to be new again. And free from sin. Hallelujah. Say his name. Yeshua. 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 Oh, Yeshua. 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 Come on. Come on. Yeshua. All around the world. Yeshua. Everywhere you're listening. In China. Iran. In Israel. All over the world. Say. Yeshua, come on, Yeshua, 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 oh Yeshua, 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 oh. his resurrection how grateful you are for his conquest in hell do you not understand he defeated death hell and the grave they all had to bow the knee to one name Jesus Yeshua oh yeah Yeshua HaMashiach the only Messiah Yeshua HaMashiach the Messiah
get in the flood Calling all hippies around the world Come and get in the flood All I mean by hippie is that you have been ostracized by men Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, get on the train Come on and jump in the king now you're prophesying was really something I'm about to show you something greater than a donkey jawbone I'm about to show you something greater than a donkey jawbone I'm about to show you something greater than a donkey jawbone I'll let you hear the sounds from your home you're alive today we are alive because he is alive hallelujah You know, while they're setting up right now, um, we're going from one end to the spectrum to the other. But not really. <laughs> what? But not, really. but not really, because it is prophetic. You know, I was listening to the Lord about 
this song and in 2017 and I'm going back a little bit but I want you to hear this in uh, 2017 we we were asked to come and and be a part of a monumental event that we didn't know how monumental it was and uh, those who know anything about bluegrass know uh, that Ralph Stanley was, they called him the father of bluegrass. And uh, those of you who don't know anything about bluegrass, you know the movie, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? <laughs> and he wrote, Man of Constant Sorrow, which is not really a faith song, but... <laughs> he wrote Death. <laughs> and he wrote Oh Death, and he wrote Rank Stranger back, but he wrote a song years ago that was one of the the most absolute phenomenal gospel songs that told the story of the death burial and resurrection of jesus and it was called i am the man thomas and so the the record label ask or the this label in nashville ask us she said, I want y'all to be the one to do Thomas. She said, I just feel in my spirit that y'all are the ones. And we were just honored that we were asked to come to the Opry and do anything involving his tribute. He had went home to be with the Lord. And I'm getting somewhere with this. So we, we go, go, but before we go, it was such a, an event, a huge event, that all hell tried to come against this event. And there was powers unknown, and it, it was just snowballing. It was getting so big so fast, the event was. And the Stanley family was putting on this as well as, as uh, MC1 Nashville. And, and so this man called the, uh, the head of this uh, event, and he told her, he said, I'm going to shut you down. He said, nothing happens this big without me in Nashville. He did. Sure did. And she called us because she knew we'd pray. And she said, what am I going to do? All these, all these people are coming. We've got this. And he's threatening to shut me down. Yeah. And uh, so Robin, we went on up there, and we went in a conference room, and we were all praying. And all of a sudden, he told her the story. Of uh, Beta, 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 Benson, Benson, Benson Itahosa, yeah. where they told him they were going to shut him down, and he told that lady of the TV uh, station there. He said, "You're fired." And so Robin looked at Darlene and said, "Tell him he's fired." And she just looked. She said, "You're fired." And then she got some boldness about her. She said called his name and said, you're fired. Three days later, three days, three days later, the biggest scandal hit the, hit the news in Nashville against this person and people begin to leave him like water draining out. And we came on, we went on and the event just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Until it was one of the largest events to ever take place at the Grand at the Opry House, there were so many people there; it was ridiculous. Five hundred people backstage. was backstage, not the audience, backstage. And so we loaded in that day, and for you know, loaded in. We taking our equipment in. Well, some of you don't. For those that don't. And for those who are, are roadies or knows what the... We, we have been roadies all of our life. <laughs> Austin walks out on the stage of the Opry. And all of a sudden, a message in tongues come out. And it was so loud. It just roared across that place. Well, we all just go. And everybody else just going like... They just stop. They don't know what, what to do because a lot of these the people that, I mean, they might have been Christians. I don't know, but we knew we was. And so he, he just let loose. You know what letting loose is? And then 
Robin interpreted it. And we just kind of went on, and everybody was like, okay, well, let's, let's get set up. We and, just right off the stage. And it was just right off the stage. Well, after that night, you know, it was a wonderful night. Everything went off. The man called her and said, I just want you to know, that's just, I just want to congratulate you for your big event tonight. And he's just congratulating her. Well, it rocks on to tw July the 4th, 21. And the Lord told me, he said, that was a, that was a tongue that had to go out in that atmosphere in 17 that preceded the event that happened the 4th of July that Kenton Candy Christmas put together, Regeneration Nashville, the 4th of July, that was also one of the biggest Sundays of the, of the, not the Rhineman, but the Grand Ole Opry, as many, who was there that, that 4th of July. Well, a sound had to come forth, such a sound off of that stage. And we, it was resurrection power the first time. Yeah. Yeah. Then on the 4th of July, independence, Whoa. which is also a resurrection. And what did I preach? And, he, and you preached on, uh, you preached on the resurrection. The resurrection. <laughs> I'm, I'm here. I'm, I had all this in my head. And he said that had to come forth because of the fight that we've been in since that time until 2024. He said those sounds and those frequencies was monumental and it helped to push the door open for 2024. They drove me up the hill, Thomas, I am the man. They made me carry the cross, Thomas, I am the man. I am the man, Thomas, I am the man. Look at these nail scars in my hand. They made me wear a crown, Thomas. I am the man. I am the man. I am the man, Thomas. I am the man. Thomas, I am the man. Look at these nail scars.
gates are open wide He's alive, He's alive, He's alive and I'm forgiven Heaven's gates are open wide, He's alive He's our life I look at them and I say what are we doing <laughs> it's offering time hallelujah <laughs> hallelujah are you glad to be in the house of the Lord today yeah. praise God happy resurrection Sunday yeah. oh my goodness there's a louder shout at the Super Bowl than that I mean, it's literally the greatest celebration of all time. Besides Christmas, which y'all know. But that's the beginning of the story. That's the beginning. This is the middle event. And then the ending of the story is when he comes back and he returns. But it may be the end of the story, but it's the beginning of it for us. Like, I was telling them this morning, I said, we get, that's when we get to open up a whole new book. <laughs> we, we just start writing new stuff. And I looked at Shelby and I said, I wonder what songs we'll sing then. What songs will we sing after, after the rapture of the church has happened? What songs will we be singing then? Who knows? He does. And so I consider this day extremely, extremely special. And I choose to celebrate it every single year. Why? Because that is the day of life beginning for you and I. That was the day that he died. He paid the ultimate price. This is the event that took place so that you and I, this is the part that always gets me, and I feel like people don't really grasp this. This is the, the day, the event that we celebrate on this day was the event that just gave you and I a choice. It just gave us a choice because he had no guarantee that any of us would be right here, right now, serving him. Why? Because it's your choice. It's your choice, and that's one thing that God cannot and will not do is override a man's will. If that could happen, well, we would all just be born going to heaven. There would be no, there would, it would literally be just the devil and his angels in hell. If that was the case. But it's not, because it's our choice. And he went through every bit of that, which you'll hear later just so that we could have that choice. Just so that we could have a choice. And that hits me harder than it does a lot of people. But you need to be grateful today of the choice that you were given. Life or death. Well, today, as on behalf of Church International, we choose life. We choose life. It's a choice that, that was bought and paid for us, so it's a choice that we get to make. And today, we choose life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And that, that brings me to my offering message today. I'm going to try to condense this as much as possible. It, that never really works out well for me, but I'm really going to try. I, I'm setting my, my sights to trying today. But it is all about him today, as it is every day. But this is like an extra party. So, you know, we, we can stay. I think we can. If you have to go, bye. 
If you need an envelope, please raise your hand. Somebody will see to it that you get one. Turkey and dressing is not that important. I mean, it's important, but it's not that important. It's not important that you can't stay here. That you can't stay here and celebrate, like I said, the greatest event of all time. Uh, those of you that are watching online today, first of all, welcome. Happy Resurrection Service. We are so glad to have you here. Remember, just because you are not here physically does not mean you are any less a part of what God is doing in this place today. But if you're ever in our area, please stop by and see us. I promise you we will make you feel right at home in Warrior, Alabama, the little town that's shaking the nations. Hallelujah. John eleven twenty five. 25, this is one of my favorite scriptures in, in the Bible. Uh, my all time, uh, I mean, it's, it's up there. My favorite is Joshua 1, 9, but it, this, is, this is in the top five. That's right, in the top five. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. All I hear is Carmen saying that in Lazarus, come forth. You know, it, you know what I'm talking about. I can't do the voice. I can't do the voice, but if you've heard it, you know what I mean. Dad could probably do it, but I can't. Yeah. <laughs> and so we're obviously in the part of the scripture where Jesus calls Lazarus to come forth. And which was also just a, a monumental event in itself. And Dad preached a, a message on this, what, a couple of weeks ago that was hands down the most powerful message on that event where, where the 12 went and loosed him and let him go. So this is where, where he says, you know, his sisters are, are, running, are, are running to Jesus and they're crying and because, I mean, their brother has, has just died and, he's, and they're just distraught. And they come to Jesus and they say, and, and they're pouring their heart out to him and Jesus asked, Jesus asked right then, he said, do you believe that your brother will rise again? They said, yes, Lord, in the resurrection he said, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection. You know what? And people think we're arrogant. That's not arrogance. That's confidence in who he was. He knew who he was. He knew at 12 years old who he was. And then the decree was made and the declaration was made that day that he was consecrated. He was baptized that said, this is my beloved son. And that's when it went out to all the spirit world of who Jesus was and what he had came to do. And Jesus looked, he looked at them and they said, yes, we believe he'll rise again in the resurrection. He said, I am the resurrection. I am the resurrection. Girl, you ain't got to wait. I is the resurrection and the life. We're about to raise him right now. You ain't got to wait that long. We're doing this now. Lazarus, come forth. Then all of a sudden, they was probably like, oh my, what? And then the next thing you know, Lazarus show up at the mouth of the tomb. And they're like, Okay, he's the resurrection and the, we're going to do this. <laughs> but I want you to notice something in, in this passage. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. They're two different things. They're separate. Or he would have just said, I'm the resurrection life. This is the King James Version right here. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. My Bible doesn't read that as one thing. It reads it as two separate things. Jesus is very strategic with everything he says. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. Well, I got curious about that. Hold, please. I'm looking at this definition. Resurrection definition. Uh, there's a few different things, but one of them, of course, is the rising of Christ from the dead. But then it says the state of one risen from the dead. Okay, that's resurrection. Being raised from the dead. Okay, 
Well, then you go to life. You go to life, and it just keeps going down. You've got um, the quality that distinguishes a vital and functional being from a dead body. So life is something, it's separate from resurrection. Resurrection is one event, but life is another. It's just like that song, uh, Ain't No Grave, when she says, if you walked out of the grave, well, I'm walking too. Okay, well, resurrection is showing up at the mouth of the tomb, but life is walking out. Life is walking out of the tomb. And, and we sing, you know, I ran out of that grave. But we're all right here. Look, at the mouth of this tomb, you see that behind me? And we're all just like this. I ran out of that grave. I'm staying right here. How many times are you going to sing that before you take off running? He said, I'm the resurrection and the life. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to raise you from the dead. I'm going to bring you to the mouth of that tomb. But then you have the power to walk out. And the man, Jesus, when he walked out of the grave, he never went back. That's another thing that hits me harder, and I guess it's just because it, came, it became rhema to me when I heard it. And so it's, it's, it's passion on the inside of me that when he came out of the grave, he walked out. He literally never went back. He didn't go back. He's still living from the time he walked out of the grave. And you have the power on the inside of you not only to come up to the mouth of the tomb but to walk yourself out. Yeah. It's time that we move on to the second half of that scripture where he says, I am the resurrection and the life. So when you were born again, when you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that was resurrection. That was being born again. You became a new creation in Christ Jesus. You were resurrected. Now he said, now I'm the life. Now go live. Go live. So many people. I, I wonder how many people on this, this day, on this Sunday morning, that the world observes as Easter, but we observe it as Resurrection Sunday. How many people walk into a church on this day and I can hear an angel say, why do you seek the living among the dead? How, 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 many, how many people are going to seek Jesus, the living amongst the dead church? Why? Because they came up to the mouth of the tomb and they never walked any further. They never, st they never moved forward. And the angel still asks the question, why do you seek the living among the dead? For he is not here. He's not here. He ain't in a graveyard. He's not in a spiritual graveyard. He's not in a physical graveyard. And guess what? He gave you the power not to be either. It's time we move forward. It's time we walk out. He walked out. He didn't lean with it and rock with it at the mouth of the tomb. Going, should I go? Is, is the coast clear? Is the demons gone? How about that darkness? Is still out there? Yeah, the darkness is still out there, but he is the light. He said, I don't care if there's darkness out there. I'm walking out in it. Guess what? Because I shine in the middle of it. And you should too. Why? That's scripture. 
as he is, so are we in this world. Quit standing at the mouth of the tomb. Step forward. You say, this is the offering message. Yes, it is. Why? Because a lot of us, we, we stand here and we quote, we give you the exact scripture out of the mouth of Jesus himself, the words in red, telling you how to prosper, but you still going. Them demons still out there? That darkness still out there? Yeah, honey, it is. But use the light. Move forward. Step forward. When you start prospering in a dark world, in a dark time, you become the most attractive thing around. Why? Because the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness couldn't comprehend it. So you stand out. You literally stand out. You don't think Isaac stood out sowing in a famine and reaping a hundredfold in the same year? Everybody wanted to be friends with Isaac. Isaac was the most popular person around. Why? Because he was prospering. This was before Jesus. If Isaac can prosper before Jesus, before being a blood-bought believer, you and I have zero excuse. We have zero excuse. Because we have the power that works within us. Exceeding abundant. Above all that you could ask or think according to the power that works in you. And what is that power? It's Jesus. It's resurrection power. It's life. That's, all, that's that glory on the inside of you. And one day it will change your mortal body. It will come alive on the inside of you and completely change your entire being so that you can run at the speed of light. And that will happen one day. That is facts. It will happen. But today you and I are supposed to be living we are supposed to be, that phrase, living our best life. Yes, you are supposed to be living your best life. Don't you know Lazarus started living his best life after that? He thought, I don't want to go back there right now. I ain't going back there till I'm satisfied. And guess what? You have the power to do that also. On the inside of you. You have the power when you made Jesus the Lord of your life. To live your life until you are satisfied. According to Psalms 91. And so today you need to make that step out of the tomb. He's brought you to the mouth of it. He spoke his word. He called your name just like that song. You dug your grave, but he called your name, and when he did, guess what? You came up to the mouth of that tomb, and all of a sudden, you're standing there. You're like, my goodness, this literally is a whole new world. Like, I'm standing right here. Now step forward. Step forward in your finances. Step forward in your health. Step forward. What do I mean by that? Act on the word. That's a step forward. That's taking a step forward when you put his word into action. And us as blood-bought believers ought to be moving forward, not backwards. Run out of the grave and stay out. Hallelujah. Because he is the resurrection and the life. And if you believe that, then you will prosper. I can promise you that. Why? Because he is prosperity, spiritually, physically, financially, spirit, soul, body. He is life and all that that entails. And so we've been resurrected, hallelujah, by being born again. Now it's time to live. Amen. So let's start living. Hallelujah.
Stand to your feet today. Hallelujah. I'm in a great mood. Are you in a great mood? Why? Because he is risen. Hallelujah. I just love saying that. Guess what? We get the opportunity to say that like every day. Every day. It's Resurrection Sunday every day. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, I want you to hold your seat up before the Lord today, whether it be your phone, whether it be your wallet, whether it be an envelope, whether it just be your hands and you believe in God to fill them. Because guess what? That's an act of faith. That's an act of stepping forward. And I want you to raise it up today as we quote the words of the living master today. Luke 6.38 says, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over shall men give unto your bosom for with the same measure that you meet with all it shall be measured to you again you say I believe it I receive it I call it done in Jesus name now if you're a tither raise I'm telling you I'm telling you this if y'all could just see it from my angle this just looks so awesome Malachi 310 bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be meat in mine house and prove me now herewith saith the Lord of hosts if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it and I will rebuke the devourer for your sake and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field saith the Lord of hosts and all nations shall call you blessed for you shall be a delightsome land saith the Lord of hosts say I believe it I receive it I call it done in Jesus name amen so be it hallelujah Glory to God. Well, we have something very, very special for you guys today. And uh, our, our drama team is getting ready to come out here. Uh, could you, can I get this moved real quick? Thank you, Five Star Frank. <laughs> yeah, Frank. Everybody give Frank a hand. Come on. <laughs> Well, I, I mentioned Carmen earlier, and um, Carmen has many, many great songs, many, many, but literally my entire childhood is Carmen, and, but Carmen has this one iconic song, and it, it actually became his biggest song of all time, and it was called The Champion, and when the youth center uh, started back for in the early or late 80s, they started doing what people call human videos, dramas, to the champion. And I have done the champion so many times. I have played almost every part except Jesus. And <laughs> including the devil, I have played that one also. And I know. I know, you can't imagine me playing that. But it, it absolutely is probably one of my favorite dramas of all time. Absolutely, because it tells the story of this event that we're celebrating today. And uh, we kind of put a little twist on it this time, but I am so proud of this crew that you're about to see today that absolutely, I mean, you guys, I've watched you. Y'all crushed it. You, you've absolutely just exceeded my expectations. And this may be my favorite time it's ever been done. So y'all go ahead and come on out here. I want you to welcome, you know, we've always, you've said, what's the name of our, our drama team? And uh, today I want to let you know what I call you. This is the Roof Rippers drama team. And... This is what I call them. This is what I see them as. And so I want you to uh, just absolutely enjoy yourself because this is going to be awesome. And please welcome the Roof Rippers as they do the champion.
in the vast expanse of a timeless place, where silence ruled the outer space, ominously towering it stood. The symbol of a spirit war between the one named Lucifer and the Morning Star, the ultimate of good. Enveloped by a trillion planets, clean as lightning and hard as granite, a cosmic coliseum would host the end of the war between the Lord of sin and death and the omnipotent creator of man's first breath, who will decide who forever will be. The champion. Of hate and lust, a stab of pride and envy, 
But the hands that knew no sin blocked everyone. Forty days and nights they fought, and Satan couldn't touch them. Now the final blow is saved for the final round. Prophetically, Christ's hands came down, and Satan struck in vengeance. The blow of death fell Jesus to the ground. The devils roared in victory, the saints shocked and perplexed, as wounds appeared upon his hands and feet. Then Satan kicked him in his side, and blood and water flowed, and they waited for the ten count of defeat. God the Father turned his head, his tears announcing Christ was dead. The ten count would proclaim the battle's end. Then Satan trembled through his sweat in unexpected horror yet as God started the count by saying, Ten. Hey, 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 wait, hey, wait a minute, God. Nine. Stop your counting wrong. Eight. His eyes are moving. Seven. He, his fingers are twitching. Six. Where's all this light coming from? Five. He's alive. Four. Oh. Three. Oh, yes. Two. He has won. He has won. He's alive forevermore. He is risen. He is alone. He has won. He has won. He's alive forevermore. He is Loud and strong, captivity has been set free, salvation bought for you and me, because Satan is defeated, and Jesus is the champion! For well, the time to hear has come, for I have stirred deep within you the very origins of your being. I have shown you in this time, in this place today, what you were born to do. So now the time has come to hear and do. Hear and do, says the Lord. Don't hear and stand or turn your back or stop up your ears. For this is the time to hear and do. This is the time to rise to your position in me. To be seated with me in heavenly places. For you died with me. You were buried with me. And you rose again with me. Take your place in the kingdom. For now is the time to shout in the kingdom. Now is the time to shout in the kingdom and shout that he is alive. He is alive and I am alive with him. Hallelujah. Come on. For I heard the Lord say, I'm going to ask you to do things for me in the future. 
And it's going to take boldness. And it's going to take hearing and doing. Hear the way Elijah operated. He would hear and go and do. He would hear and go and do. This is the time for you to hear and go and do. Do not sell yourself out for these days. Don't sell yourself into this age. For I am the modern generation, says the Lord. Be strong in me and the power of my might. And I will show you what thou must do. For you are to take your place as kings and victors and overcomers in this day in which you live. For demons are going to throw up on the earth. They will begin to spiritually puke and vomit in the earth. For your presence as a light shiner from glory will scare them to the point they will throw up. In the earth, and you will see it happen. Look for it to happen, for it will surely happen, says the Lord, the King. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Praise God! Give the Lord a praise in the house. Hallelujah! Hallelujah to the Lamb. Lord, we bless you. We thank you. We give you honor and glory and thanksgiving, Lord, for you are God. I want you to, uh, yes, Lord, give us eyes to see and ears to hear, that we can learn your word together as a family in Jesus' name. You know, I want you to... Um, Go over to Genesis, and we're going to look at chapter 1 for just a moment. Genesis chapter 1. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> I want you to look at uh, verse 11. We'll put it on the screen so we can... Read it together. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. Say the third day. Verse 26, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion. Say dominion. dominion. Over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. It's like the old saying was, I've heard people say, he was even given authority over creeps. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion. Say dominion. Over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. I want to talk to you today about something that we're going to learn as we go through this today. The Lord said it to me this way, and it was puzzling to me the way he said it. The resurrection of a king is an amazing thing. When Adam was created and his body was made, the resurrection was foretold. But when God raised his body from the dust, it was told the resurrection of a king was surely coming. 
In Genesis 1, verse 11, it says, On that day God planted everything that had seed within itself. Everything. Including man. Man's body. On that day, that was day three. Day six, then man was It was finished in the creation of man. Man was brought out of the earth. That's three days and three nights. And that reconciles Genesis 2, verses 6 and 7, together. They married together. It's the word. Now, what happened was, and you've heard me say it before, and maybe you haven't. So if you haven't, you're about to. In those days... There was a mist the Lord caused to come up out of the earth. Now we really find that there was a river of life that came out of paradise and watered the garden. And from there it was broken into four heads. But, but it also speaks of it, and you start looking at the translations of it, it's talking about a river of light, a river of revelation. And it was coming as a mist up out of the ground. And in those days, there would have been five, six feet, maybe more of topsoil. It was in the perfect time in paradise. And so on that day, when that mist came up out of the earth, the glory of God shining with the revelation of God had come up out of the earth and was covering the whole face of the ground, Genesis 2 tells us. It was covering not just, not just watered the place where Adam was, but the whole face of the ground, all of the earth. Everything was watered. And so on that, in that time, God did something that no angel saw, none of the creation could see. It was a very concealed thing. He stepped down into that mist, into that glory, And God lay down in the wet earth and he sank into the topsoil of the earth. Something was going on there. He was casting his image in the earth. A cast is not like a cast that you see anywhere, just that you would think of as a cast wrapped around your arm, even though it's kind of like that. But a cast is this way. I got curious at the time, so I looked up the cast to see what a cast was, to make a cast. And to make a cast, I watched this guy take a five-gallon bucket, and he filled it full of plaster. And he let the plaster kind of get, you know, it was wet. It was just the right consistency. And he let it kind of get starting to get kind of rubbery maybe. And then he had this couple take their hands like this and fold them. And they pushed their hands down into that bucket. And when they pushed it down into that substance, he let it kind of dry. And then they pulled their hands out. And you could see it was kind of rubbery still. And when they pulled their hands out, then he went and mixed up another substance and poured it inside that hole. And then it was a little pink. It was colored pink. And so he smoothed it over. And then he let the whole thing dry. Then he turned the bucket over and pulled the bucket off of the dried. And you had an image of the bucket. But he knew because of the place where he had smoothed the hole. So he turned the bucket over and looked at it. Then he started removing the plaster and the debris from around the pink. And as it went down, you could see the veins in the arms. And it started revealing the cast of the couple's hands. This is what's meant by God making man in his own image, in his own likeness, in the earth. Now, I want you to look at Psalm chapter 139. Let's look over there at that. And we're going to look at verse 15. Watch what David says here. He says, My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. God's Word translation says, When I was being skillfully woven 
in an underground workshop. So within that time, think about it. For three days and nights, God was working in a workshop under the earth. And the earth concealed a secret that no angel knew. No creature had seen. Think about it. God in his workshop under the ground. And the earth was, it was curiously happening. And only the earth had a voice. And only the earth God was speaking to. And so the earth knew something. And in that time, after three days and nights, then God went back to the place. And he began to uncover, this is Genesis 2, 6 now. He began to uncover the earth. And when he uncovered the earth and he got to the bottom of where it was, there lay his cast. Just like him. Look just like him. And then the Hebrew says he shadowed the cast. Means he laid down on top of it and put his mouth on the cast mouth, his eyes on his eyes and his fingertips to his fingertips and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of that life Krista was talking about. The yah. And when it did, the man's soul came alive. And that breath went into him, came through his bones, and Myra began to push blood to, the, to the, all the places it should be. All the organs were curiously made. He was fearfully and wonderfully made. And then his eyes opened, and the Lord raised him up out of a grave and stood him in front of him. And we don't have any record but maybe we do. The grave stayed open for a long time so the creation could see where the king was. Because the Bible said that Adam was given the earth. He was the king of the earth. And so the open grave was open where all the creation could see, the animals, everything. They all could see. And Adam was the only man, him and his wife, who had no navel. Because he was created And so the raising of a king, it was foretold that one day God would take the form of a man and die and be raised after three days and nights. And it was woven into the fabric of the creation. Satan has been trying ever since that day to find the door to that underground workshop. No, I think I said more than we heard. He's been working ever since that day. He's hunting the door to that underground workshop. He wants the access to it. He's trying everything he can to get to that. He wants to do that because he wants to be a man. But the raising of a king is a curious thing. Hallelujah. Amen. After the raising of the man's body from the dust, the, dust, the dirt had a hidden knowledge of it. God himself had spent three days and nights working on this. It was domain. Have dominion. That means the man was a king. And had a domain. And everything in the earth would respond to him. 
everything. The Bible talks about the behemoth being the chief of all the creatures of God. And it said he was subject, the only one that could approach the behemoth. He said, I made him with thee, talking to man. I made him with thee. And the man could approach because the respect, the fear of all of the king was upon all creation. And if Adam walked through the garden, if he reached for a fruit on that tree, if it wasn't there, it would be by the time his hand reached for it. Every blade of grass would stretch itself out to cushion his step when he stepped on it. And he was robed in the glory of God. He had a blood covenant with the Creator. The blood covenant of God, when God exhaled and breathed into his nostrils, you have no idea what took place at that moment. Light would have hit this earth so bright, and when it hit it, it was resurrection power, bringing him up out of that place, and light would have hit it so powerful that demons would have shielded their eyes, screeching and, and screaming. Even outside the garden, light flashed through the earth. <laughs> Something had happened. And God was reproducing himself and naming an heir. And he, he laid above him, showing no one else was above that man but God. And he was the man's source. Nothing else could meet a man's need. And when God exhaled into him, that the man was made out of red earth, so the marrow produced red blood, but God's blood is light. And so light hit him. And when it hit him, it shook him. And don't you know it shook that cast like that, and it would have been enough to have burned his image in a place in the middle of the earth. The domain, a king. Hallelujah. The earth shook as God uncovered the man's body. And in that light, man was raised from the dead. Are you with me? The dirt leaving an open grave for all the creation to see where the king lay. How it was all done was a mystery hidden in God. Whatever Satan was going to do now, he was going to have to shove man back in that hole. Whatever he did, if he was going to succeed, if he was going to accomplish anything, man was going to have to be shoved back in that hole. He must force him back into the dirt. So the battle began. The lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. All dust, the lower call, calling constantly. Trying to get him back in that hole. Now we'll look at Galatians 5. I, I, don't, I don't know why. Maybe. Maybe I do. I don't know. I think I do, but we'll see. I got a brand new Bible here. And so I'm, I'm trying to wear it out. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm trying. Now Galatians 5, it's not marked up, so you got to give me just a minute. Galatians 5. Listen to this. Verse 18, but if, you had, if ye be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh, verse 19, that's what I want you to see. The works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. All this witchy stuff is just a work of the flesh. 
hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, uh, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. <laughs> and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. So Satan had to get us <clears throat> back in the dust. The scripture says this, that when man sinned and fell, the woman was deceived, the man was not deceived. And so when the woman took of the fruit, she saw that it was good for food a tree to be desired, to make one wise, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, the pride of life. She took that fruit. She did eat thereof. And Genesis 3 says she turned to her husband there with her, and he did eat. When he did, that glory went out. And all the earth went into confusion. They didn't know who to listen to, what to do. They didn't know how, what to do. And so when that happened, then man had fallen and everything under him had fallen, been made subject to this vanity. And the Lord God said to the serpent, remember? He said, you'll crawl the dust and the dust you'll eat. And so that's what he eats, dust. Dust. A snake crawls around on the ground. They don't see well. And they can't hear well. But they can taste well. And they crawl and they lick their tongue constantly trying to find where dust is being kicked up. So whatever's kicking the dust up is a possible prey. Whatever starts kicking that dust up is a possible prey. Satan took the robe of the man. And the man had no covering. And he took his robe of authority. The cloak of glory had went out. But the man had three garments, garment of praise. He was robed in glory, and he had a tunic of authority that lay next to his skin. And so when all of that went out, the man started scrambling. He don't know what to do, and he, he, he looks at himself. He had no need of multiple layers of skin before this. There was no death in the earth. And he was robed in this glory. And all the earth knew it too. And he wore a, a crown. He wore a crown. And he's walking with the Almighty in the cool of the day, in the Ruach of the day, in the Spirit, as the Spirit of God would come into the earth. And the Hebrew talks about how the, the atmosphere would come alive and what made everything live would start coming alive. The, the power that made the trees live, the power that made animals live, the power that created all life would start teeming up as Adam began to prophetically worship. What was he doing? He was worshiping according to his future. He was seeing all the way down through his purpose and he was worshiping about what he would accomplish with this glory and in the image of God and being the full heir of the Almighty. He would worship according to that and all the earth, the trees would sway and the, and the rivers and the seas would boil up because the fish would worship and all the creation would begin to pick up on his prophetic worship and because all the life in the earth was teeming and coming alive, alive 
blood and just teeming in the air like electricity. And when it did, the, and the Hebrew says, God would walk up in the life of the day. God's interested in your future. He walked up in his future. And he would wrap himself in the life of the day and tell Adam, walk with me. And they would walk in the garden. And they would conversate in the garden. And they would talk about his future. They would talk about his heir. How he was the heir of, of the almighty. Angels like royal guards probably walked along beside them. And when Adam and, and his father would talk. Two burning lights walking through the garden. They would turn, I imagine ever so often, a revelation more would hit Adam and he'd look at his father and those blazing eyes, would, his, Adam's mouth probably automatically opened like a baby nursing. And he would look at his father and life would fill him and angels would bow. This is why the scripture says when God gets up in the, in the heavens and stands, it says they all fall prostrate on the ground. And when he walks through heaven, the smoke of his glory fills the temple. When he walks, the air comes alive around him. Everything trying to give him all it has. God walks by a tree and the fruit produces. It's trying to give him everything he put in him. He wants everything he ever put in you. He wants you to live in the glory he gave you. I don't know. I guess I'm alone in here today. I, but we're speaking of a prophetic time. We're speaking of prophetic destiny. God's interested in that. Amen. And everything you do, everything that keeps you from it, is Satan trying to shove you in that hole again. He knows that the biggest thing, biggest mistake was ever made. The scripture said, if the princes of this world had have known, they'd have never crucified the Lord of glory. They didn't know he was getting up after three days and nights. They didn't see that because it was hidden in that mist. It was a mystery hidden in God. And they didn't realize it was a prophetic destiny that a king would be raised again if the other one, oh, come on now. And so this thing would begin to swirl and it began to go. Now, you've got to understand something. As soon as Adam fell, don't think it was a cry. You th you, we talk about the shot heard around the world. When he fell, he probably screamed the most pitiful cry you've ever heard. When he saw that go out on him. Listen, says the Lord, for I'm telling mysteries to people in China. I'm talking mysteries to people around the world who's never heard this. And I'm going to raise them up and they will not argue with me. They will walk on into it and raise the dead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So when... Adam fell. The most pitiful scream and cry was probably heard. The cry heard round the, the earth. And probably no matter where it was, what was that? The king fell. And suddenly animals turned on each other. Roses grew thorns to try to protect itself. Things started adapting fast. Adam pitifully went to the Lord. 
in that fig leaf suit. And he said, I need a covenant to live. And the animals that trusted him, he had to go tearful eyed. And they were backing away from him because they could smell the fear on him. And he began to approach them and they started backing away. And he lured them to him. And then with tear-filled eyes, he took their life and offered them as a sacrifice, those that seemingly was like his friend at one time. Now what happens? The covenant of blood. See, there's five levels of authority. There's God, man, angels, animals, and the plant life. Five kingdoms. Kingdom of God, kingdom of man, the angelic kingdom, the animal kingdom, and the plant kingdom. You see? And they're standing there, I picture it, God, man, angels, animals, the plant life. And so when man and an angel switched places and man willingly bowed his knee and gave Satan his authority, then that angel walked up out of place and disrupted everything in divine order. And he walked up into this place standing between God and, and his creation. See, you think, why didn't God just knock that man in the head, make another one and start over? Because he had made the man, given him free will and given him the creation. Crowned him as a king. And so, <laughs> yes, Lord. And so, Satan had authority and said, you stay away from him. He's mine. And he picked up his tunic of authority and he began to operate in that power as the God of this world. Now Adam had influence from someone else. Now he knows good and evil. And so he's, he's there, and the Lord God gives the prophetic word. The first shot of the war, Genesis 3.15. Put it on the screen so everyone can see that. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I will put enmity, or war, between thee, talking to the serpent, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, serpent, and thou shalt bruise his heel, prophesying the crucifixion and the seed of the woman the virgin would conceive. God was already in the future. Him and Adam used to discuss a lot of it. And so Satan didn't know what to do at that point. But he walked through the earth. I'm, an, I'm the God of this world. I'm the God of this world, he would say. And all of his minions would bow. Animals were afraid. He had it going his way. Everything's trying to kill each other. Cain's already killed Abel. But the blood cried to God from the ground. The ground? Wait a minute. The ground? David said, I was curiously wrought in your underground workshop. The ground knew something. And just when Satan thought he had something going his way, just when he thought it was going his way, there was a rumor going around. The earth 
had a rumor. All the creation was whispering this rumor. What was it? In that underground workshop, hidden from view, the ground was having a rumor. The king's coming. There'll be the raising of a king. Satan couldn't understand that. What? What did they say? But the ground still had the rumor. It haunted him night and day. Every, no matter where he went, no matter what he did, no matter what he thought he could accomplish, the trees, the ground would still sway and groan together. And they were whispering a rumor. A king is coming. <laughs> so Satan... And all of his trying to shove man back in that hole. There was a rumor in the earth. A rumor coming from the lower kingdom. Kingdom, the plant kingdom. A king is coming. The resurrection of a king is in the making. In the lower kingdom since the fall of Adam. Of the resurrection of the king, of a king. Satan has been trying to find the doorway to that underground workshop ever since that day. Now you just learned a mystery. Maybe, I, maybe you don't want to know a mystery. Maybe you'd like to embrace a rabbit laying eggs. I realize, and everybody should know, that this is not the day on the calendar he rose from the dead. It comes before Passover. But we are, we are standing today celebrating his resurrection. This could be every day. It could be every day to us. Man, I just don't think, oh, my God. I just don't think, oh, y'all ought, ought to do, oh, my God. Oh, my God. You know, you're so legalistic, you can't even poop right. You're spiritually constipated. We got enough sense to know. I got enough sense to know. I do, I, I know, I mean, I got a sense to know. And I know Friday to Sunday, I mean, come on, guys. Probably more like Wednesday to Saturday evening or something. I mean, I, I, I understand. But just by not celebrating, not even taking the time, if the world is going to say this is the, this, this is the day we're going to do this, well, then you know what? Let's step up and tell them what happened. We'll just tell them what happened. Hallelujah. So Satan has been trying to find that underground workshop. He wants that thing bad. So you just learned a mystery. That's what, well, we're right back at the mystery. What is the mystery? Well, there's a lot of it. So what is the mystery I'm talking about here? Well, you just learned one big one right now. Now you learned where the giants came from. The mingling of seed. The cross-pollination of, of creatures and men and, and angelic forces and this and that. You just learned Satan trying to find that underground workshop. Now, you'll catch that in a minute if you just think about it. That's his results of his search for that workshop. Because if he can find that workshop, then he can figure out how to mingle spirit and flesh. And that's what he's after. 
He always wants to be a man. Oh, I, why do you go in there? Well, I don't, I don't know. I went a lot of places. Go over to Isaiah. <laughs> Isaiah 14. Listen to it from a prophetic viewpoint. Amen. I don't know what to think about you, brother. I, you know, I, 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 I don't even know if you saved. <laughs> well, I'm glad that, that God knows I am. I know he knows because he's the one did it. <laughs> now, so Isaiah, the prophet who's not afraid to ask. Oh, it's amazing. Isaiah, it, it, you, you're talking about a heavy hitter, man. Isaiah, oh my goodness. One of my favorite prophets. He said in verse 12, he asked a question. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? What was he seeing that he would ask Lucifer a question? Whoa. He's caught up somewhere else. He's witnessing something that took place. How did you fall from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? And he tells you. He viewed the whole thing in the, pro, in, in the prophetic. He viewed the whole thing in the spirit. He said, how are you cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? He's already through to the point where Satan is weakening nations. He said, for you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven, showing he was on the earth. At that time, he was on the earth. He was preparing. He was on the earth station. And if you want to know where his throne was, the ancient Jews teach it was on top of Jericho. Which means the moon. It's the Hebrew word for moon. And they teach that Satan's throne sat on the moon. And that when it's full, he has his widest expression of power. They call them lunatics. That's in the New Testament. Said he was a lunatic. That's what they're referring to. Had never heard people say, must be a full moon tonight. Why? Because men are total idiots. <laughs> I'm just giving you a little background. He said, for you said in your heart, and, and, and Lucifer was... Was that, was that was the godly name, light bearer. He fell and became Satan. He would bear the light. What does that mean? Well, Lord, why did I, am, I, am I really supposed to get into this? Why on this day? Boy, I didn't plan on it, but here we are. I guess we just forget it and move on. We'll just, we'll just go. <laughs> no, we don't want to forget it. I don't want to forget it. <laughs> In the very beginning, when God created, there was nobody but God. He has no beginning. He has no ending. He's called the El Elyon, the most high God. There's no moster high. He's the most high. When he looks up, there's no one there. He's as high as you go. He told Isaiah in Isaiah 40 through chapter 45, he said, if there was another one like me, he said, I would at least know him. He was telling Isaiah these rocks and trees and all that men are worshiping are no more than wind. Probably secondhand wind. There's no more than wind. That's why he said, if there was another like me, I would at least know who he is. 
Oh, God can't. Oh, where did, oh, where did God come? I heard one man tell me one time, God, I know where he came from. I said, where? Teman. <laughs> well, yeah, from the Teman region when he came to rescue Moses at the Red Sea. God arose from Teman. That's why. <laughs> there is no beginning to the Almighty. That's why he's the Almighty. Well, I can't comprehend that. I know it. You don't even remember what it was like to be born. You don't even know what it's like to be born. You watch babies born, but you don't remember being born. You don't know what it's like, and you're going to, you're going to figure out God. You gonna figure out God? I could say something crude, right? Here. But you gonna figure out the Almighty? You have to. I'll put it easy. You have to bathe your body, or it stinks. And so he was creating, and everything that is was within him. He drew a picture of what he wanted and he released it in a word out of his mouth. And what was in him became out here what he saw. And the angels, the angelic world was created. And he's so big that these living creatures fly around his throne 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they're looking into God. They're trying to look down into his depths. And every time they pass those blazing eyes, they draw back. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. And all they know is he was, he is, and he is to come. <laughs> they, the, if you ask one of the seraphims, if you ask one of those living creatures, where did God come from? They'd say, he, he was, he is, and he is to come. And so they keep searching and searching inside him, and they grew eyes. They begin to develop more eyes. Maybe we can see, and they were looking for this aspect, that aspect. They keep looking, and the Bible said they're full of eyes within and without, flying around his throne, searching with him with all those eyes. And still they draw back, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. God, do you know how big that is? He was, he is, and he is to come. He is the Almighty. Do you understand? Almighty. He is your life and the length of your days. You live every day because He is. And so these creatures, these, these angelic beings... They would watch him and they would search him and they can't get past his holiness, his holiness. They can't get past that down into what's stirring down inside him, which was his love. And man was created there. And he would send, he, he, had, he has a, the, the stones of fire that burn before his throne. And Lucifer would walk up and down in the stones of fire. It didn't take long for the rest of the angels to notice he was different because he was anointed. He was anointed. We don't read of other angels being anointed, but he was because he had to carry the word. And he would walk up and down in the stones of fire. And that's where these metaphysical cults get to where they walk barefoot on hot coals. They're trying to mimic their, mimic their master. And so they walk up and down in the midst of those stones of fire. Look, they don't even burn my feet. Hold him right there for a second or two and just leave him right there on those red hot coals and let's see how long it don't. And they walk 
and they walk up and down. He would walk up and down in these stones of revelation. He wore an ephod. Every precious stone was his covering. He was the high priest of the world before man was created. And these revelations would shine up in those stones of fire. And he would pick them up. Oh, look at this. And he would lift himself up to the center of the earth. And he would spread those wings. He's a cherub. And he was a living instrument. Everything in him, there was harps. There were, there were, were tambourines built into him. There were these harps. There was these bezels that, that held jewels that were fastened in him. They were hollow so they would sound. And he would lift himself up. And he would look at this revelation. And when he did, that tambourine would beat out a rhythm of life. And he would start to sing the revelation out before the creation and it would hit the crystalline canopy that was around the earth and it would reverberate all the way around the earth and the earth was a sound system like no other and all the creatures would stand out and sway waiting on the precious word of the song of the Lord and then the day came the brightest of all revelations because it was the reason for all the rest. He saw it. And he realized. And he asked this question. Watch this. Verse 13 of Isaiah 14. Isaiah said, For thou hast said in thy heart, when he saw the revelation, it drew him back. And he said, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars. I will be, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, showing he was below the clouds. I will be like the most high. He didn't say I'll be the most high. He said, I want to be like him. He was talking about the authority of the man he found in that revelation. He's supposed to sing the song of the man's authority because God is getting ready to go into his underground workshop and make this man. And he's supposed to prepare the environment and tell the creation, you are about to have a boss like no other boss you've ever seen. It won't be an animal. It won't be a tree. It won't be a fish. It's going to be God's image. It will be the one like the most high, like the most high. And so when he saw that, it filled him with anger and violence. And Ezekiel 28 says it filled him with wrath. He said, I will do all of these things. And you can read right there what the man could do before he sinned. If you want to know what Adam could do before he sinned, look at what Jesus could do when he walked out of the tomb. And he says, I will be like that. But the next verse, Isaiah's still talking about it. He's still telling it in prophecy. He's watching something. God took him somewhere and saw the whole event. He said, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the, of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee. And consider these saying, is this the man? He's all the way now looking at something coming. That made the earth to tremble and did shake kingdoms. He said they'll look at him as narrowly. You mean this is the thing that did that? When you ever start to realize how big you are in the world of the spirit. Just a lost spirit could house a legion of demons. And still have enough mind to bow down and worship God. Worship Jesus. 
That's how much bigger he is. It's a flask that could hold six to 10,000 demonic forces. I don't know how much of this you want to hear. Did, did you hear that? I'll, I'll say what I can of that. Did you hear monotheism? Did you hear the Lord talk about that? He's talking about God. He's talking about who is God. He's talking about an implication who's not. The Lord will say more about this as we move into the service. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, now, whoa, whoa, whoa. What about it? Well, where were we? Were you noticing? So where were we? So he said, they will narrowly look at him. Man is so much bigger. Satan knows it. Christians just don't. So Satan gets Christians interested in the dirt. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, the pride of life. And, 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 and you know, I understand lost people. But, but Christian people, they lose it like a crazy-eyed weasel <laughs> when you dangle flesh in front of them. <laughs> they just lose it. Surely God wants me to do that, don't he? He wouldn't have gave me these feelings if he didn't want me to use them. That's really things people say. It's like one time I was playing pool with somebody years ago. And I was playing pool. <laughs> and I said something they didn't really understand what was going on. They said, yeah, if we think about it, we'll make up some more rules as we go, won't we? <laughs> that's kind of what that's like. Living like a hog. Now, and so they said to narrowly look upon them. Well, a, a, a human being, Satan knows this, but he's got to get you in the flesh because a serpent crawls the dust. But the dirt carried a rumor all those years. A king's going to be raised. And he's coming up out of this dust. Satan couldn't stand that. So he walked around and he had this robe of authority, but he couldn't control the rumors of the lower kingdom. Hallelujah. Now, don't you just stay with me a minute. How do you want me to, what, what do I say about, about it from here? Where do I go from here? Now, so... Satan's biggest deal was to stop that revelation of God's image. So he said, I'll be like him. And he revealed your authority right there. So he takes this argument to the court of heaven. There is a court in heaven where the judge resides. How many of you are still with me? You want me to... I mean, I don't, you, you, if, if you're tired, slip out, go throw water in your face, and then come back. But be real quiet about it. 
I'm picking at you, but not much. Now, so he, so you, he says, he goes to the court of heaven. Now put up Psalm 8. I'm trying to show you something. The raising of a king is a peculiar thing. Oh, Lord. Now see that word, Lord? All capitals, that's the word for Jehovah or Yahweh or Yahweh. This is God in his system of government. So, so he, we know this is an angel talking because of Hebrews chapter 2 quotes this and says it was an angel talking. <laughs> that's how we know it. And it says that this one earnestly protested in a certain place and said this. Oh, Lord, our Lord. Master, how excellent is your name and authority in all the earth. Who has set your glory above the heavens. Now this is the way Lucifer approached the court. This is how he approached the king, the court. He can't get into where you can. And he never could. Next verse. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength. Now he's revealing the revelation he found. And he's earnestly protesting in the court of heaven over this. He knows he's about to be subordinate to somebody. He didn't know there was a jo job open between the Almighty and him. He might have applied for that position. Now he's filled with wrath. The thought of him having to bow to another creature just appalls him. Oh, just stay with me. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength. He saw it in the revelation. David, being a prophet, saw all this and heard the conversation. He said, because of thine enemies, that thou mightest steal the enemy and the avenger. Next verse, when I consider the heavens, thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast, hast ordained, what is man that you're mindful of him or the son of man and the son of man that you would visit him? What is he? What is this creature? He said, for thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. And that word angels there is the word Elohim. Made him a little lower than you. Next in the chain. He said, and you crowned him with glory. Whoa, there's the crown. Satan couldn't wear the crown. He could only wear the robe of authority. But the crown was lost to him. You have to understand the underground workshop to wear the crown. Oh, come on, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> come on now. For you made him a little lower than the angels, and you crowned him with glory and honor. You honor this thing. He says you made him to have dominion. There's the king's domain. You made him to have a domain. Over all the works of your hands. Whoa, whoa. He just said you created the sun, the moon, and stars with your fingers. And now you've given him everything in his domain that you made with your hands. So his authority reaches to the sun, the moon, and the stars. Oh my goodness. This kingdom's getting bigger by the, by the moment. And he said, you put all things under his feet. He saw the man's feet. He's a cherub. He's got a hoof. He saw the man's feet. Oh, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beast of the field. Whoa. That includes that snake. The beast of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea. And whatsoever passeth through the paths or the jet streams of the seas. He even has authority over the jet streams and anything that passes through it. Yes. 
Then he closes his argument. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Like that's going to smooth this over. <laughs> Don't you know the rest of those angels are standing there? Michael probably grabbed his sword <laughs> when this started. All the angels are appalled. It takes a lot to shock an angel. But the fact that this anointed one would do it and challenge the authority of the Almighty. And so you see the grand scheme, the grand picture of your authority. And the crown Adam lost. Satan wants that crown. He wants it so bad he can taste it. He wants that crown, but he can't wear the crown if he can't figure out the underground workshop. He has to gain the knowledge of what happened so he can mingle spirit with flesh. He tried it when he did the giants. He tried it when he, he created the hybrid races. He tried it with all of that, but it so disrupted the dimensions and the fabric of the creation that it, it unfolded into a catastrophic flood. It came into the earth. And the only eight that wasn't corrupted was on the ark. And so... This is what brought in the flood. This is what brought it in in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. It talks about, and the Spirit of God moved over the face of the deep and over the face of the waters. And it means death-filled waters. Murky, seed-filled, semen-filled waters. Now you know what caused it. Lucifer trying to do this. Man, I don't even know. It just sounds so crazy. That sounds so crazy. Really? It sounds crazy to you, huh? Now, to be so crazy, here is the thing. To be such a crazy thing and to be on such a crazy train Everybody's up in the air, even governments, about the eclipse. There's things I can't tell about that until later. But I'd be glad to tell all of our partners in private. But I can't tell that right now. Because they're in for a huge surprise. And so, so, but at the, even the governments, did you know they're deploying National Guard in some places so where it's going to be the path of totality because they're not sure what's going to happen. They're telling people, go ahead and get food. Just stock up on some food. And one of them said, don't send your children to school that day. Why would they do so? Whoa, why would they do such a thing? Well, here's the thing. Here's something. That there is a place. Maybe we should ask these questions. You know, prophets ask questions. And, and maybe inquiring minds won't answers. We hate you, Brother Brother. No, you don't. No, you don't. You, you hate the truth. You don't want to know the truth. Why? Because the truth is not as exciting as a lie. A lie keeps you entertained. Oh, you get people, you get people online, on Facebook. Let me see. Uh, they stole the identities of five Tunisian camel jockeys and, and, and they, they, moved into, they moved into a certain area and, and, and now they, have, they, they are taking and they just come up with this crap. 
and they just start saying things and it don't even make a lick of sense. I mean, not a lick of sense. And they contradict themselves from one statement to the next. But the people just sit and look at it and just feed on it like hogs eating slop. I mean, they just, just got, yeah, I, I grew up on a farm. I know what it's like to see hogs eat. If you ever watch them eat, you ever feed them, you probably wouldn't eat no more of it. And I'm telling you now, but you eat what you want to do, but I'm telling you straight up, my job, I used to have to go slop them hogs at 10 years old. You know what they ate? Well, what you did is you kept a five-gallon bucket by the door. And any scrap, anything, meat, bread, it didn't make no difference what it was. You raked it off in that bucket at the end of every meal and you put a board over it with a brick on it or it stunk so bad you couldn't stand it. And when it was full, you carried it down to the hog pen. And it slosh out on your foot. And when you didn't have running water in your house, that's tough. And so you'd, you'd carry that hog slop down there. And when you walked up, when you walked up to that hog pen, we didn't have no fancy hog pen either. Our hog pen was built right by the old still that was built right over there. And, and you could see where the revenueers had busted it all to pieces. And that was part of my heritage I used to look at. They'd say, you know what that is? And I'd say, what is that? It's a steel. Well, you could tell what it was now after you look at it. But we always put the hog pen. They had it right by it so you could see it all. And then they just stuck up boards, anything to keep them old hogs in. And the hogs trapes mud about this deep. Yes, they do. Don't tell me about it. Don't even try. Don't even try. That's like me trying to tell you what your living room looks like. If I said, that's what they do on, on these, these pages. They've got a living room with a red couch. And you could say, no, I don't. I don't have a red couch. Yes, you do. I have authority. I have it on authority that you have this red. You want to say, are you touched? I mean, really, you finally, y'all understand touched? Are you touched? That's what we used to say growing up. You know, are you touched? Are you, are you right in the head? I know what my couch looks like. You don't. But they convince people, oh, yeah, he's got a red couch. He, he's got a red couch. He's got this and this and this. I don't even have any of this. They just, they're just making it up. <laughs> oh, stupid people. <laughs> and so they, well, not, maybe, I don't know, maybe that is right. Yeah, stupid. Oh, you shouldn't call them stupid. Well, don't act it. Lord, you got sense. Well, that's it. They're stupid then. <laughs> now, what, 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 what it is, you, you, folks, Honest to God, really? I mean, really? You know, they, oh, they, they just, mm. but lies are entertaining. But the moment the truth is accepted, the show ends. It's over. So nobody wants to hear the truth because it ends the show. They top that show immediately. So they got to hear a lie to keep the show rolling. You know, what they end up watching after a while is wrestling shows. <laughs> you let a 400-pound man, six foot seven, hit you in the face, and I'm going to tell you, you ain't got much of a face left at the end of that. I mean, they cave your whole being in. You don't take two men that size hit each other the way you see them hit, but that's the way they it's, uh, I'm on body slamming. Pick him up and you watch him jump. They help. I mean, you know. But here in the South, real as it gets, baby. <laughs> no, I'm just, somebody said that one time. And I'm just, what I'm telling you is heavy. We need to laugh a little. 
Well, don't get all bent out of here. This is church. The Bible says God sits in the heavens and laughs. <laughs> he does. And I didn't call no names, so I ain't insulted nobody. I, I mean, I said insulting things, but you don't know who it was directed to. But we have to ask ourselves some questions, don't we? Now, I want you to watch this and watch this close because we're, believe it or not, we're about ready to close today. <laughs> Remember the raising of a king from the dead. That's a peculiar, amazing thing. The raising of a king. And so this crown is being sought for by Satan. I'm, I'm, I'm talking to you about some spiritually heavy things now. But this crown is being sought for by Satan. He can't wear a crown of glory. He's searching for that crown. Now, he could wear the tunic of authority, the God of this world. He got that from Adam. But he can't wear the crown. He couldn't find the crown. So he begins to search for something. But he can't find it. Now, I'm going to put it in perspective, and I want you to listen to me. In when Jesus went to the cross, yeah, I will, Lord. I tell him real that, yes. He, the five levels of authority. When Jesus was on the Mount of Temptation, notice I said temptation, he never sinned. Spotless, sinless, Lamb of God. Hallelujah. No blemish in him. Oh, my Lord. Jesus the beautiful. I mean, Jesus the powerful. Jesus the king. And so he's on the mount of temptation. And Satan comes to him after 40 days and nights of fasting. And he says, command these stones to be made bread. Now, this is, if, if this is not possible, it's not a temptation. He, Satan, is saying, I've only seen one other son of God. Let me see you do what he could do. Command the stones to be made bread. This is to do with the, the plant kingdom, so forth. Then he says this. Now watch this. He said, take yourself up to this, this uh, pinnacle and jump off. Every time Jesus would answer this way, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. God speaks from the future and it hits you in the face as you move forward but you can also hear every word that comes out of his mouth you have the ability to hear it can you imagine you can't even imagine that God speaks and you can hear it God could speak from now for a 14 million forevers and never say the same word twice and you can hear every word. So he says that, and then he tells him, you know, jump off here and, and, and do this. And he starts tempting him with these things. But then watch what he says. Now, this is where I'm getting to. He takes him up and shows him all the kingdoms of the world. And he says, all these were given to me. He said, I'll give them to you if you'll bow down and worship me. Said they were given to me. Who would have gave him those kingdoms? Adam. What kingdoms? Well, you're thinking Russia, Italy, France, or back then Persia and different ones, Rome. No, 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 no. It may have included some of that. It may have included a lot of that. But that's not what he's really speaking about. The kingdoms. The kingdom of man, the kingdom of animals, the, king, the plant kingdom. He said, all these kingdoms were given to me. I'll give all the kingdoms to you if you'll bow to me. 
And he's touting that tunic of authority. Notice Jesus didn't say, liar, liar, pants on fire. Nobody gave you that. <laughs> Said it was a temptation. He knows that robe. But watch, Jesus is not wearing Adam's robe. He's called the last Adam. He has his own. He's wearing his own. And so the two robes met each other on that mountain. And he said, I'll give you all these kingdoms if you'll bow to me. Jesus said this to him. The rest of the time, he's saying it is written, it is written. Then he said, it is said. And then Jesus said this to him. You get the hints, Satan. This means you take the lower position. In other words, he's saying this to him. You don't belong up here next to God in the place of man. That's my place. You take the lower position. You get behind me. You go down there and you get away from me. And the Bible said when he said that, he said Satan left him for a, a better season. So he's going through all of this and the day came. He gets, up on the, he gets up on the cross and he ends up on the cross in the crisis of the age. In the fullness of time, God sent his son. The harvest of Adam's treason was about to show up in the earth and it was going to grow dark that day because hell had belched itself out on the earth and was going to an, an annex earth into hell. Hell has enlarged itself for my people, the scripture says. I Isaiah talks about it. And hell beneath is stirred up to greet thee at thy coming. And so that day, it was all going to come down. And Jesus, that's why his timing was perfect. It was impeccable. It was constant, perfect. He said, go in and loose the, the donkey and the coat. It'll be there at this time. Go get it. He said, go here and a man with a pitcher, follow him. It was perfect timing. Everything he said happened exactly at the moment he said it would happen. And then he looked at his men when the Greeks came to him and said told Andrew we want to see Jesus we want to see him they said why because the Greeks worshipped the anatomy of the body and Jesus body was perfect he was absolutely the perfect man his biceps his chest his body he was beautiful in every way he wasn't like you and me he walked around and he, he was stunning standing out in a crowd and when you saw him you knew who he was you knew he was something very special Special. And the Greeks had heard about him and they said, We want to see him. And Jesus looked at Andrew and said, Now the Son of Man must be crucified. Why? Because the Bible said there would be no beauty in him, no comeliness that we should desire him. He's saying, Now is the moment of the crucifixion where I'll be marred more than any man. They're wanting to worship his body. He's saying now is the time it will become the prophecy. So when he gets to the cross, he didn't even look like a man. He didn't look like a man. He looked more like a piece of meat hanging on that cross. And he's hanging there. And his lips are this big where they've been beaten grotesquely out of proportion. His body, the, the, the miracle of, of all of watching him in the physical was the fact that he was still alive when he got there. His face was marred more than any man and his visage, his visage marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Nobody had ever been beaten and marred this way. He was beaten with a Roman cat till you could see the organs from the outside of his body looking into his flesh. You could see them as they beat him nude and they beat him to where they ripped his body open and the blood had run out of his body, not just coagulated blood. It was running out of his body. He goes to Gethsemane before he gets to the cross. Remember that? And people try to give him, say all kinds of things about the king. When he said, his sweat became as great drops of blood. 
And he came out of his place of prayer and his disciples were sleeping. And he said, the three were asleep. The rest were all out there. He said, could you not watch with me one hour? He looked at them and he said these words, my soul, his mind, his will, and his emotions. He said, it's so heavy and sorrowful that I could die. I could die here. Such anguish, his sweat, blood was oozing from his sweat pores. He said, I could die. Then he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He's not talking about his death. He's talking about let it pass. I could die here. He said, let this pass from me if it's possible. So I can go all the way to the cross. Why would he have to go to a cross? Because Adam hid in the trees. And he said, if, if it could be possible, let this death pass from me in this garden so I can go all the way there. He already said I'm going there. He said, what do I do? Pray I don't go. He said, for this reason I came into this world. He wasn't trying to get out of dying. He just thought he was going to die there. He wanted them to pray that he could pray and help him pray to complete his whole mission. He was fighting to stay alive, to suffer it all. And he said, if it be possible, let it pass. Let this cup pass, but nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. And an angel came and strengthened him. On the mountain of temptation, he did battle with the kingdoms. One of the scriptures says that he was with the wild beast. It just throws it in there. You ought to go back and read it. It just throws it in there and says he was with the wild beast during that temptation time. Why would it even mention that? Showing he's the king over the kingdoms. He gets on the donkey riding in on the triumphal entry. A donkey that ain't never been rode. Don't throw him. With people screaming at him, not six inches from him in a lot of places. Waving at him, palm branches, throwing their clothes at, out in front of him. And that little donkey never moves, just keeps walking. He's the king of the kingdoms. Angels come and minister to him in the Mount of Temptation. An angel came and ministered to him. It said angels came and ministered to him. Showing he's over the angelic kingdom. He's over the plant kingdom. He's over the animal kingdom. And so, he said, nobody even takes my life. He said, I'll lay it down, I'll take it again. Now, y'all, you really need to hear this because we're about to close here. And so he goes to the cross. And he's hanging on the cross, dying. And if you'd have been standing there looking at him, you would have just, you'd have had a hard time looking. Because he didn't look like a man. He was beat beyond recognition. And when he opened his mouth, could you imagine what that looked like? He'd opened his mouth beaten that swollen. And, and spit and blood would try to hold it together. And you'd see him talk through strands of blood. And his eyes beat so swollen shut. He's looking through slits. And all the preachers are really, respond, uh, are really helping him in this thing. They're saying, if you're him, come down from the cross. If you're him, all the religious leaders of his day... And then none of them, even if they didn't believe who he was, then why didn't they show any compassion? Because they didn't have any compassion. And they would say, if you're him, come down and show us now. So he starts praying in other tongues. You, you know, they drive the spike in his feet. 
Because when, when you're crucified, you breathe in and you can't exhale. And you push yourself up on that spike and let the air out and then fall back down and your, your air won't come out of your lungs. You're being suffocated like a python squeezing you to death. Let that sink in a minute. And while he's hanging there, he would go into convulsions and beat himself on the cross, beat himself against that cross. If you're him, come down now. We'll believe you now if you come down. And they're overloading his soul, his mind, his will, and his emotions. So he just starts in. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. Lama sabachthani. Said it had to be interpreted because no one knew what he said. Being interpreted was the 22nd Psalm. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the 22nd Psalm is the crucifixion Psalm where they say they pierce my, he, it says they pierce my hands and feet. They part my garments and cast lots upon my vesture. They do this and he describes the whole crucifixion and he's saying no matter what they say, well, no matter what they hurl in my teeth, no matter what they say, I am the fulfillment of the 22nd Psalm. And he said he's not coming down until it's finished. On resurrection Sunday that we celebrate him rising. Why don't we talk about these things? And so he prays in other tongues. It's interpreted. John interpreted it. Said it. Had to be interpreted. Well, the Italians were standing there. Greeks were standing there. Hebrew-speaking people were standing. Nobody knew what he said. He's speaking in the Spirit. And then suddenly, he did something that shocked everybody. And they didn't know exactly what he was doing. He said, Father, forgive them. Because they don't know what they're doing. Don't you know those soldiers were probably laughing and then suddenly one of them went. He ain't even looking at them. He's praying to his father. Why would he say such a statement? Because Abel, when he was dying, his blood, the voice of his blood called to God, called to the Lord from the ground. The voice of his blood, the voice of your blood means whatever as you're dying, if your blood is running out, whatever it's speaking, that's the voice of your blood to your crying, your last word. Abel was saying, hold, don't hold Cain guiltless. Cain murdered me. But Jesus' blood spoke better things than Abel's. Abel's brother slaughtered him. Jesus' brothers were slaughtering him. And his blood spoke better than Abel's. And today, Father, forgive them. When one sinner comes to the Lord and makes Jesus the Lord of their life, it echoes through heaven. Father, forgive them. Father, forgive them. And no matter where an angel is, no matter where another person is, they hear that sound and they know someone else just came into the kingdom. So as he dies... And the 22nd Psalm says that demons came around and began to pull his spirit out of his body. Why? Because 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He who knew no sin was made to be sin. It didn't say he carried your sin. He became our sin. When the earth grew dark three and a half hours and all those demonic beings came upon the earth, 
It, it literally says in translation, in transliteration, it talks about how the, 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 every demonic force of hell was belched out on the earth and the misery came with it. And it demanded sacrifice. It demanded payment for Adam's treason. And he was the payment. He was there, so and all he became our sin, so that's what they came for. And they dragged his spirit out of his body. Read the 22nd Psalm. And as they dragged him into the pits of the damned, the Bible said in the book of Acts, he said, Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. Where did he go? The word hell there means just exactly what it said. He was carried there because he became our sin. And for three days and nights, why? Because of the first prophecy. Three days and nights. He lay in the pit of the damned. This little emaciated spirit had withered to the point. And, it was, and he was suffering the torments of hell so that you and I wouldn't have to do that. Because somebody's got to pay for the treason of Adam. And if, and if you don't let him do it, then you have to do it for you. If you reject him as Lord, you're saying, I'll keep my sin. You can die for everyone else's, but I'll keep mine. And if you ever do that, then guess where your destination is? There ain't nobody going to hell. You better not die believing that. So he's, he's in the pits of the damned. He's suffering that. Every, every person in paradise looking over that gulf in Abraham's bosom is watching all of this happen. Nobody can help. He has to trod the wine press alone. And so he's suffering the torments of the damned of everything you and I have ever done or ever could conceive of doing. He who knew no sin was made to be sin. Not one sin, all of it. And he's laying there. But after three days and nights, the scripture said, if you read the 22nd Psalm, Jesus left his words in the air that says, I'll do this, this, and this, but I will praise you in the great congregation again. He talks about being resurrected. And when the 22nd Psalm ends in the Amplified Bible, it translates it this way. It is finished. So everything was finished in his words. And so the Holy Ghost took those words and went into hell after the beloved, after three days and nights. And as they started going in through hell, Satan, listen to me, when Jesus died on the cross, it is finished. And he said he gave up the ghost. Remember when he said, Father, into thy hands I commend, commend my spirit. It means into your instrument I deposit all that I am. In other words, I'm sowing my life as a seed for all of them. When he died, the earth shook. And the scripture says the graves were opened. And many that slept arose and went into Jerusalem. But not till after his resurrection. Whoa. We missed that. We think he just, they, they all just got up right then when he died and went into Jerusalem. No, nay. It says, after his resurrection, they got up. But the graves were open. It said the rocks rent on their own. And the graves were opened. The graves were opened. Someone opened the graves. 
Satan hunting that underground workshop. But he can't get anybody up because he's not the resurrection. He may have wore the tunic of Adam, but he's not the resurrection. There's only one resurrection. And the bodies don't move until Jesus comes out of the tomb. And after the Holy Ghost went down into hell hunting the beloved, he finds him laying there. And when he comes up over him, he hovers over him like God did in the underground workshop. And when he opened the grave and laid down on Adam, eye to eye, mouth to mouth, hand to hand, and breathed into him, the scripture says this. He said, again, I'll be to him a father, and he'll be to me as a son. And again, he saith, when he bring the firstborn, the first begotten into the world, Again it happened. And if there's a firstborn, there's got to be a second and a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth. And so he's never again called the only begotten. He's now called the firstborn among many brethren. Oh, oh, come on. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. And so when the Holy Ghost went down through the caverns of hell. Couldn't you see him <laughs> moving? Light streaking through hell. Demons hiding. Men tormented, can't, can't look. And he finds the beloved. When he does, all those demons begin to flee to each side, getting off of him quick. And the Holy Ghost lay upon him. And repeated those words. Thy throne, O God, is forever. Let all the angels worship you. And again, you're, you're a son to him. Again, he's your father. <sighs> and when he breathes into him, he raises up and light hit the underground workshops. Boom, boom. It's hitting everywhere. And Jesus raises up off of that place. Totally hurling demons. And it said he led captivity captive. He triumphed over them in it. That, it gives the connotation of the old kings conquering another, stripping him down, putting a collar around his neck and throwing all of his, his kingdom's possessions into these little cars. And the king, the conquering king, goes down in front of all the people. In this case, the cloud of witnesses watching. And he goes down through there. And every time that king starts, starts to, he jerks him along. And, and, he's, and he's being led in total triumph. Jesus comes out of that tomb holding death by the juggler. Before he walks out of that tomb, he bridges the gap between hell and paradise. And don't you know when he stepped up there, Abraham fell on his face. Isaac fell on his face. All the saints gone before the thief on the cross fell on his face. And he said he led captivity captive. They all received him as Lord. And he led them into the new Jerusalem. And couldn't you hear the shout? Lift up your gates, O you, oh, your heads, O you gates, and let the King of glory come in. And the cry comes back from the watchmen on the wall of the new Jerusalem. Who is this King of glory? He's the Lord, strong, and battle is he. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish you could see this crowd. Only nobody can stir. Only God can stir that inside you. That's something you know. And so Come on and sing a new song. Sing a song of triumph. 
and sing a song of victory, says the Lord, and begin to sing with a new harmony and a new sound. Begin to sing with a new tune, for I will write the tune within your spirit, and you just open your mouth, and I will fill it with the words to say. Sing a song that no one's ever heard. Sing a song that you've never heard. Sing a song, says the Lord, of a song of victory, a song of triumph, for that's where you are today. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now to close this, we have to go this, this, we've got to go a little farther. So he comes out of that tomb. The government tried to seal it. The religious world tried to hide it. The government even put the most powerful thing they could, a seal from Caesar on that tomb. They, po they posted guards, part of the Roman guards, that if they even fall asleep, they die. And they're all standing there. And then suddenly when he comes back up through that tomb after leaving paradise, he comes back up into that body laying on that slab. And when he does, light hit that place so hard that it charged the entire atmosphere. And around that stone, light flashed and lightning began to flash as he's picking up his body. And the angel of the Lord descends from heaven. Boom! And when he does, you ain't no, you think it's some little fat baby with a bow and arrow. No, no. He comes down, this massive creature. He comes down from heaven. It's the Lord's angel. And he comes down, the one over the heart. Harvest. He comes down, boom, and when he lands on the earth, he looks around. Every Roman soldier falls like they're dead men around him, falls all around him, and he, he gives that stone one move, and it bounces across and up on top of something, and it just sits there, and the king of glory walks out in great power, shining with light. Shining with the lightning of his countenance flashing. Swoom, woom, woom, woom. And that massive angel bows down immediately because God in the flesh walked up in his face. I imagine when Jesus looked, he looked at the angel bowing. And he looked at him and glanced and kept walking. And he walked around soldiers and walked through them. While soldiers lay there, some of them, they were as dead men. They were probably looking as those feet went past him and they could see the giant holes in the feet as he walked by and they thought, oh God, maybe he just don't notice me. And he walked out. Now watch this. You ready for this? Here's where it was going. When the Holy Ghost started raising him up out of the damned, Satan would have started screaming, you can't have him. You can't have him, God. That's sin. Can't you see that sin? And I always think of Fonzie <laughs> during happy days. Remember Fonz? Hey. I always think of the Fonz. When he walked up to the pinball machine, <clears throat> they, they had been bullying Richie so long. The bell was broke on Arnold's pinball machine. And so these two big tough guys in their, in their, uh, the, their gang outfits, I guess they were, I don't know if they're street gangs, biker gangs, but they're standing there in their gang outfits. They said, we need a bell, we can't tell. And they grabbed Richie and said, Put your face right here and you be the bell every time you see the ball hit it. And Richie was going bong, 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 bong. <laughs> Just bullied to no ends. And when Satan screamed, well, Fonzie came in the, in the place and saw it. And he walked up to them. You know, everybody, nobody messed with him. He had a reputation. And so he walked up to him, let Richie go. He said, I need a bell. He said, maybe you don't notice this. Maybe you need a closer look. 
And he shoved the bully's face down in the pinball. Satan's screaming, you can't have him. <clears throat> That's sin. Can't you see that sin? I always picture God taking him by the neck and saying, look, have a closer look. <laughs> it is sin, but it ain't his sin. It's their sin. He never committed a sin. So he's coming out. The sin can stay, but he's coming out. Hallelujah. That's not all of it. You ready? So when he walked out of that tomb, now you got to remember something. When Jesus died on the cross, there's a reason <clears throat> the gambler's at the foot of the cross. Remember? Well, you don't remember, but you've read it. They're casting, we would say, shooting craps for his clothes. Playing, throwing lots, casting lots to see who could get them. Because he's famous. They ripped the first garment. They ripped the second one. But the tunic... Do you understand what it represents now? All of a sudden they start to tear it and the, the head soldier says, no, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Don't tear that. He said, that, that costs too much. Satan was telling him, don't tear that one, don't tear that. I gotta have that. I gotta have that tunic. It represents his tunic of authority. Because see, only the, only the rich wore three garments. And Jesus had on three. And this one didn't have a seam in it. Imagine it being woven from top to bottom with no seam. Perfect. And so there he, they said, we can't, no, 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 we got to have that. So they said, let's, let's gamble for this. So they just ripped up the others and divided them. But no, we got to gamble for this one. He started gambling for it. And Jesus said in 22nd Psalm, he's praying it in other tongues while he's watching them. Upon my vesture did they cast lots. And so he's, he's looking at this thing. So Satan, when Jesus dies, he goes into hell with our sin. Satan gets that tunic. Now he's got them both. The first Adam and the last Adam. But when the last Adam starts raising from the dead, he says, you can't have him. He knew something was wrong when the bodies wouldn't get up out of the grave. He had both tunics, but he can't get anybody up. He can't get anybody up. That's the way Christians ought to be when the devil walks by you. He can't get you up. And so he's, he looks, he knows something's wrong, and then God starts raising him from the dead. He starts trembling on the inside. You can't have him. You can't have him. Can't you see that sin? God, have a closer look. It is sin, but it's not his. He never committed one. Now he's coming out. The sin can stay. But he's coming out. Now watch this. He does come out with great power. And he walks out of that tomb. Picture him dragging death by the juggler vein. Satan's a whimpering something over here in a heap. He's dragging death by the juggler. And he drags him out there for everything to see throws him down when he comes out he jerks that tunic of authority and takes them both watch now you gotta, you gotta see this scripture he holds them up and he said all power 
The Bible said the first Adam was of the earth, earthy, but the last Adam was the Lord from heaven. So he said there's two tunics for each Adam. One came from heaven. One was king of the earth. He said now, all power in heaven and earth is given to me. So he puts his tunic on and he throws you the other. And he said, now, you go and cast out the devil. Whatever you bind on earth, I'll bind in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. The two tunics have been given back to the rightful heirs. He took Adam's back. He gave you his. He's got these tunics. Whichever way they work, he's wearing one. And you're wearing the other. And so he tells the, his people. That's all I got time to tell you today about it. He said, or I, I, I've got all the time the Lord has, but I don't think it's, we should go further. He said, you go back and wait till you be endued with power from on high. First thing he did is he gathered them around him in John chapter 20, I believe it is, and he breathed on them. He did this. <sighs> Don't that sound familiar? He said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And they were born again. He said, now go wait in the upper room until you be endued with power from on high. And it said, they came down tongues of fire. The original language that God and Adam spoke to each other in. And he said, the fire set down on each one of them. And it was there that day, the second crowning took place. The raising of a king is very unusual. The raising of a king. The raising of a king. I don't know if you understand what I just said to you. The resurrection of a king is an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing. Now you understand, he's called the king of and the Lord of. <laughs> oh, yeah. Now we're going to look at these two last scriptures and then I'm going to turn the mic over. Romans 6, 4. I'll look at you. Now you are it. Oh. I thought you were finished. <laughs> this will make your lunch set way better. <laughs> Romans 6, 4. Therefore. <laughs> Brother Hagin used to say, when you see the word therefore, you stop and see what it's there for. <laughs> therefore. We. Say we. We. Oh, are you born again? Yeah. Say me. me. What about you? What about you? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism and death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Come on. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. <laughs> Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. We were buried with him. We were raised with him. We died with him. 
Heaven records that you died. <laughs> Earth records he did. Now heaven knows he's the lamb slain. But it's recorded in heaven that you died. Therefore you have a right to be there. That's why Christians need to avoid depression. Because a Christian will start talking about dying. And if you start talking about going home, and it ever crosses a line in you, there's nobody can keep you here. You're going to have to quit entertaining depression. Yeah. Revelation 1, 5, and 6, and this is our scripture. Hallelujah. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness <laughs> and the first begotten of the dead. He's number one. My number's in there somewhere. <laughs> so is yours. We don't know where, but it's there. The first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And hath made us kings and priests. Wait a minute. We've been made, I dare you say that loud. Whoa, we've been made kings. The crown was found. We've been made kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion, Whoa, domain, forever and ever. Uh, if forever wasn't enough. Then they added an ever. Forever and ever. So we, uh, we, we think about and study this forever thing. Don't we? You know, you're gonna let, you say, well, you're in forever. Yes, you are. You're already in eternity. You're going to live it somewhere. So you, forever... We think about forever. You know, you have a mount of granite rock five miles high, 25 miles around. One hummingbird lands on the top, sharpens its beak every day, flies away. When it whittles that rock to nothing, one day of eternity just passed. And that's not even a correct analogy. That's forever. But now, when we get to heaven, we're going to get to look at the and ever. Whoa. Forever, but then there's the and ever. What's waiting in that? What is that? We don't even have a clue. We don't even have a clue. There ain't no reason to pretend you have one. And ever. It has to be something we're going to do after forever. Must be something else happening after forever. He washed us. I want to read you this one thing. I said it was, it was the last scripture. I want to read you this one thing. But I will re refer to this anyway. That um, when Adam was created and the Lord uncovered the man's body, and he raised him from the dead. The dirt, he left an open grave. But as he was coming up, think about this. He was cleansed and cleared of all debris. He washed him. He washed it off of him with his word. The water of his word. And so now you have three that bear record in heaven the spirit and the water and the blood. 
that gave it every right for everything we claim to this day. Oh, hallelujah. Somebody ought to shout. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. That was a lot. If you've never made Jesus the Lord of your life, today's the day for that. The Bible said today's the day of salvation. Why don't you simply do what the Apostle Paul said all over the world? Simply do what he said. He said, if you believe in your heart, God raised Jesus from the dead, and you confess with your mouth that he is Lord, you'll be saved. Think of that. Now you've got every, you, you know enough to believe God raised him from the dead. And now you know why. For our justification. So why don't you just say, Lord Jesus, I believe that God raised you from the dead. I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord and personal Savior. Cleanse me. Wash me with your word. Make me a brand new creature that never existed before. From this day forward, I claim you as my Lord. Hallelujah. And you know what? You could say, forgive me and cleanse me. You could say, say it, forgive me. Don't call it mistakes. Call it what it is. It was sin. Confess that before him. You can't remember every sin you ever committed, but you can confess sin, that you are a sinner and you need a Savior, and he is it. Hallelujah. Yeah, yeah. That's really pretty cool, huh? All of that. And now you, you caught a glimpse, a prophetic glimpse of what was what. Just a glimpse. That's all we looked at. I mean, just a, a very quick glimpse. Amen. Don't stop there. Get baptized in the Holy Ghost. Say, Jesus baptized me in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit tells me what to say. And then just start thanking Him for baptizing you in the Spirit. Why? Well, think about it. Then you yield the most powerful member of your being to the Lord, your tongue. Life of, power of life and death is in the power of the tongue. So then you just start trusting him for every syllable, giving them this. Just begin to talk. Say what you hear. It's the original language Adam and God spoke to one another in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And now I perceive we're receiving communion. <laughs> Are you doing that? Adventure Camp came to be with us and receive communion. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and put that on the screen, verse 23. We'll start there. We'll read through verse 26. As we go through this. Now he, now that you know what took place, we want to partake of his body and blood today. Hallelujah. The Apostle Paul says this, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Now you, you have an idea of remembering what his body was broken for. For every sickness, every disease, every plague, all depression, everything. Anything that could harm you in the physical, his body was broken for that, and he bore that on the cross. This is why he didn't look like a man. It wasn't just the beating. It was what he became on the cross. 
So we hold up this that represents the body. That is the body. We break it now. We give you thanks, Lord, and we break this because you broke it. We do it symbolically that he broke his body for us. And we thank you. Let's just hold it up and thank him. We just thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you that by your stripes we are healed. Go ahead and say it. I am healed and made whole. Now, whatever that is in your body or in your mind, if they call it mental illness, I call it a devil attack. You go ahead and say, I'm free of that in my, in my mind. My mental status is perfect because he became so depressed he could die so that you and I could be free. Hallelujah. And now we receive the body. Mylon Lefebvre used to tell me, he'd say, now his body is in my body. <laughs> yes. Hallelujah. Now he says this, after the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament or the New Covenant in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. So right now in the name of Jesus, we hold this up before you, Lord. Lord, and we right now are going to partake of the blood. Lord, this is symbolic of your blood that, Lord, we believe that we are now entering your body and your blood in covenant with you. And Lord, we thank you that the blood was shed for the forgiveness of our sin and to right every wrong. And watch this, folks. The life of the flesh that you just took of is in the blood. So now when we receive this, everything you call for in his broken body is energized in your being. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the Lord. What a resurrection service today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. Thank you, Adventure Camp, for joining us for communion. Afterwards, parents, you can go and, and pick up your child. Aren't they beautiful? Man, that's the future. Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor John and Madison, for all you do. You're such a blessing. Hallelujah. Everything that they do is absolutely for the growth and the spiritual growth of your children. And some of you just need to go on Adventure Camp and watch whiteboard stories and, and all, Landon and everything. I, I love it. It gets interesting. Hallelujah. Well, there's a lot coming up. I know today is Resurrection Day. I know you'll be going, a lot of you, with your families today. I want to speak a blessing over you. Um, we have our, do we have the what's coming up? The, there's what's coming up. And, and <laughs> May 2nd through the 4th, the Sword of the Spirit Conference. And so you don't want to miss it. It, it is a, our first prophetic conference. And I'm telling you, there's so much going on in the world that you, you don't want to miss it. You don't know what's coming out. There's going to be, uh, Robin will be uh, here at night. And it'll be Bernadette Smith. And Amber Bullock Marsh. I'm excited. I'm telling you what. The Lord has really given Amber a lot of prophetic revelation. And, and I'm so excited to hear what the Lord is, has, is showing each one of these prophetic people. Not only is Bernadette. She is in a governmental. Gover uh, Bernadette Smith. She is very, very 
uh, prophetic and uh, we need her and and how many and I just want to recognize just a moment and congratulate um, Drenda Cassie she won the position in Ohio in that awesome commissioner was that uh, the Ohio cap the county commissioner what a what a powerhouse Man, they better watch out. Uh, and yes, and Bernadette, she's in the uh, the Republican Party. She is a, a vice, vice chair of the, of the RNC, the state of Michigan. I, um, yes, and we have prophetic people in these positions. Also, coming up next... Is, is the roof ripping people. Meet me on the rooftop 24. Oh my goodness, June 7th, 8th, and 9th. And, and it is just going to be awesome. We have some great things coming up with, with uh, the youth. We had a great time Tuesday night with them. I was with the youth. And uh, they, they are a powerhouse. They are a force to be reckoned with. And I'm so excited. They let me tag along with them Tuesday night. And we, we had the best time. I didn't go get ice cream with them, but it's okay. Oh. <laughs> but they had a great time. Amen, amen. What, and what? <laughs> you never know what's going to happen here. Uh, this is a prophetic word that I was supposed to have read earlier. And uh, I want you to hear this. It says the Lord says this to me. Every one is looking for the prophet to predict the future. And this happens, says the Lord. But this is not the on, this is not the the only function of the prophet. But also to prophesy the end from the beginning. To prophesy the outcome from my mind to the material existence. This too is one of the functions of the office. I have told you of a Trojan horse coming. Now it has begun with the attack on Moscow, the attack on my America, and the key to freedom. I hid this key inside my America. This key is now under attack like never before. Behold, the Trojan horse has arrived. Will you willingly take it in? For I am calling my officials, my military officials, my generals, my leaders, says the Lord, to recognize the Trojan horse. Recognize it now, for it has begun. Do not take it into your protected walls. For within lies the enemies of my people, of my America. Beware. Do not take it into your protected walls. For within it lies the enemies of my people, of my America. Beware the Trojan horse. Beware the Trojan horse. For now we prophesy through the end of the thing. It has been done. Speak it and see it done. For weak witches are playing off of the weak political leaders and their hijacked power. Remember this hijacked power. But my word says the Lord will stand forever. For there is no weakness in me, says the Lord. My counsel will arise and stand forever. For watch now, as I cause my own in the highest court in the nation, the Supreme Court, to rise and decree my decree, says the Lord. You seek to stack the Supreme Court. Well, says the Lord, I have already stacked it, says the Lord. A stacked deck, says the Lord, with my trump card at the forefront. The joker does not count in this game. And the only wild card is my people Israel. Come on, says the Lord. For it is time to command the weather. 
It is time to show power greater than chemical trails. It is time to show who controls the portals above. It is time to show who the only extraterrestrial is. Me. But I am not a little green man, nor am I an E.T. creature. I am that I am. I am the beginning and the ending. Quit comparing me to fools and foolish ideas, for I am not a foolish idea. I am God, says the Lord. Beside me there is no other. Quit playing games, says the Lord. Stop. Stop playing games. You have called Ali Ali Atsum free to witches and occultic leaders. But I speak to the born again. I speak to the born again FBI, the born again CIA, the born again generals and politicians. Call out to me and I will answer you, says the Lord, and I will answer you. For I long to talk to you again. I am, says the Lord, I am the God of your fathers. I am the God of your ancestry. Hear this, says the Lord. I am the modern generation. I am your life and the length of your days. For I have told you, pastors, if you have run with the footman and it has wearied thee and has wearied you, how can you possibly contend with horses? For you have hidden your faces when you were needed to stand up the most. And you have not defended my prophets. Why? Is it because you have become Eli? Is it because you have grown fat on your own denominations? It is time to fast your religion so that I may send you the truth. The truth, you ask, yes. The truth so that you may regain your courage. One of the functions of a prophet is to bring direction from the Lord as passed down from the court of heaven, to bring a unity among the people and at the same time a separation between God's people and those who serve Baal. We see this with Elijah on Mount Carmel. This was a word of the Lord. And the word the Lord gave to me. And I said, says the Lord, so that you would know. That's not me talking. The Lord gave me these words. And so, this is why it says, thus saith the Lord. These things are where we are. And we look at today. We look at today trying to be mingled and marred with the proclamation of transgender recognition to mingle what's considered the day we celebrate resurrection and mingle the two things together. A Trojan horse, a Trojan horse It was said by the power invested in me, but the people have to invest the power. And it hasn't been done yet. We will not share the resurrection with this thing. Why? Why would we do not do such a thing? Because, because, it just gives a reason to keep people's identity stolen from them and keeps a whole generation out of the, the presence of God. For identity is where it's at. And today they said to recognize the identity. It's always about identity. The enemy cannot afford for this generation to see who they are in Jesus and who he has called them to be. Amen. 
So such a thing has been done. But I, I declare and decree today, no weapon formed against us. No weapon formed against us will prosper. And every tongue that rises against us in judgment, we will condemn. We will prove to be in the wrong. Now, right now, we call for that generation that is blinded and trying to be sanctioned just to keep them from their destinies. We call right now. Let them go. Let them go. Come forth in Jesus' name. Lord, let their identities settle on them, the true identities of what you called them to be in this time. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. It is not a generation of young people that have been taught now since they were born that it's okay to be homosexual. It's okay to be transgender. It's okay to mutilate your body because this is God's will. Those are deceived young people for the most part. But it is the full-grown clowns that dress, men that dress like women, that come in and sit in front of our three-year-olds, five-year-olds in public schools and read to them that it's okay. Those are in danger of hellfire. While those who are deceived are just deceived. So we call for their freedom. We call for their destinies to be seen. Reach for them. Tell them how Jesus loves them. Talk to them about how much he loves and cares for them. Tell them they have a destiny and a future. Talk to them about the love of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't give up a generation. Don't give up a generation that could be full of Billy Grahams or Roberts. Could be full of William Branham's and Jack Coe's and Maria Woodworth Edders and, and all. Of them. Don't give them up. How do you overcome a lie? With the truth. Preach the truth. Those who know better is very easy to recognize. Those who are deceived are too. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray over each and every one today. I pray, Father God, as they go to to their place, Father, wherever they're going today, Lord, that we are a family free of tragedy, free of destruction, and free of a bad harvest. Angel of the Lord, angels of the Lord that ministers to the heirs of salvation, go forth and divert any disaster on the roadways today, in their path today, Lord. And I thank you for great favor on each and every one today. And, Lord, we give you praise and honor and glory. And remember that we love you, Jesus loves you, and God is absolutely good. Shalom, shalom.